And you can also find it in Psalms, but in every case they're talking about things that they have set aside for the Lord. What you do find in the New Testament a good bit, but only in the book of Acts, at least according to my concordance, is the word devout. You find devout in several different places. The first place is in Acts 2 and verse 5, and it says, And there, and there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. This is when they had come together and they all spoke different languages, but as the apostles were preaching, then they could, they heard them in their own language. They were all described as devout men. Chapter 8, verse 2, it says, And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. Acts 10 and 2 said, and when they were describing Cornelius, says, A devout man and one who feared God with all his house, which gave alms to the people and prayed to God always. I hope that's what we're all ascribing to be. I hope we're all ascribing to be devout men and women who are serving God and who are devoting our time and our efforts to the Lord. When we talk about devotion or being devoted, or we talk about being devout, what we're talking about is our relationship to God. We should be seeking to please the Lord. If you want to follow along, we're going to start in the book of Ruth, which tells a story about a young lady and her mother-in-law. The first seven verses of the book of Ruth kind of sets the scene, if you will, for the rest of the book. Uh, and this story is not just about, and you're going to see when we get to the verses, it's not just about Ruth's devotion to Naomi. And she was devoted to Naomi. But what you're going to see happen in this book is Ruth is going to reject the gods of her fathers, Ruth being a Moabite, she's going to reject the gods of her fathers and she is going to cling to the God, Yahweh, the true God, the God of Israel. So the first seven verses kind of paint the scene. There's a famine in the land. Elimelech and his wife Naomi and their two sons to escape the famine, leave their home, and they go to Moab. Doesn't tell us what Elimelech did for a living. We don't know how he earned. We don't know if he was a farmer, was he a shopkeeper, we just don't know. We don't know why they were in famine. The scripture does not tell us why they were in famine, whether it was a drought, whether it was just too many people in too small a place but they were going to leave and go to Moab. They lived in Bethlehem. When they get to Moab, Elimelech dies, leaving Naomi with her two sons. Her two sons marry two women, local women of Moab, which is Ruth and Orpah, and they lived there for about 10 years and then Naomi's sons died. And so she's left in a foreign land with her two daughters-in-law. She hears that the drought, or the famine rather, has been lifted. <coughs> and so she makes the decision to return with her daughter-in-laws back to Bethlehem. On the way, or maybe before she left, she had a change of heart and she wanted to convince her daughter-in-laws to stay in Moab. And we're going to pick up and read some scriptures starting with verse 8 in the book of Ruth because I want you to hear her argument that she had for her daughters-in-law. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house, the Lord deal kindly with you, and ye have dealt as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. 
The Lord grant you that ye may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. And then she kissed him, and they lifted up their voice, and they wept. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. But Naomi didn't give up. At that point she says, Turn again, my daughters. Why will ye go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters. Go your way. For I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight and should also bear sons, would ye tarry for them till they were grown? Would ye stay with them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. <clears throat> Naomi believed that the hand of God was against her. And Naomi was probably, although it doesn't say this, you would think she was probably reluctant to take her daughters-in-law that she loved back to her home as they were foreigners. Moab was a foreign land. And they had had a history with the Israelites and not a good history with the Israelites. So they would have been foreigners away from home they were widows without husbands. She was a widow without a husband. And she was reluctant for them to return with her. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave to her. Orpah decides, I'm going to go back to mom and dad. I'm going to go back to my parents. Naomi convinces her to stay. Ruth does not. Ruth is going to stay. And in verse 15, you'll see Naomi tries one last time to get Ruth to return with Orpah. And uh, after this, it's two verses, verse 16 and 17. And if you love poetry, these, it's two of the most beautiful verses in Scripture. Ruth says, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. That's pretty, isn't it? But I want to point something out to you at the end of verse 16. She says something really important. She said, and thy God, my God, at this point she rejects the God of her fathers and takes on God Yahweh. And if this was a children's story, we could stop right, right here and say, and they lived happily ever after. And that's the truth. All of the bad things that have happened to Naomi and to, and to Ruth in this four-chapter book of Ruth are over at this point. Naomi doesn't realize this yet. But I believe that by clean God, Ruth has ensured Naomi and her of God's blessing in the future. In verse 18, Naomi finally accepts that Ruth is so determined that she's just going to go with her. So she gives up trying to convince Ruth to stay. Verse 19 through 22, they returned to the small town of Bethlehem and they're greeted there by the people. And Naomi reveals and just Imagine a little bit now, I, I couldn't find out exactly how big Bethlehem was at this time, but it was a small town. Like most small town, everybody knew everybody, and when Naomi came back, everyone knew Naomi, and they were glad she was back. 
But Naomi reveals her bitterness at this point, having no husband or sons. And she actually tells him to call me Mara. So she doesn't want to be called Naomi anymore. She's that bitter and she's that disgusted with the way she is again. But she believes at this point that God has been punishing her. It's also important to note that at the beginning, at the end of this chapter, they had returned to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. So then you go to chapter 2, and in verse 1 of chapter 2 is where we first meet a man named Boaz. It says, And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth, of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. Boaz. And Ruth says to Naomi that she's going to go and glean the harvest. And the barley harvest had just started. Gleaning is a process that they used to clean up the fields after the, after the crops were picked. It was typically done by people who were poor that had no land, that had no harvest, and it was set aside in Jewish law so that those people could get food. So the glean was to go behind the people who were harvesting the crop and pick up whatever they had dropped, whatever had fallen on the ground, whatever was left. Tough work, tough work at any, at any point. And Naomi agrees, and Ruth goes to glean after the reapers in verse 3 and just happens to go by happenstance is, is the word that she used. She goes to a field that's owned by, by Boaz. Verses 4 through 6, we said, And behold, Boaz comes from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. Then said Boaz unto his servant that was set over the reapers, Whose damsel is this? Speaking of Ruth. And the serpent that, the serpent that was set over the reapers answered and said, it Is the more, more badish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and had continued even from the morning until now. And she tarried a little in the house. And you're going to see now what type of man Boaz is. He comes to the field, and the first thing he does is blesses the people that are working in the field. And then he's curious about this damsel that he sees. And he says to Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, neither go from here. Hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art thirst, go into the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. So Boaz invites her to continue to glean in his fields. He makes sure that she's not molested. He makes sure that she has drink. She makes, he makes sure that she doesn't go anywhere else. And so she falls on her face and bows herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes, that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? And he answered and said unto her, It hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband. And how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity and art come unto a people which thou knowest not the heretofore. The Lord recompense thy work and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel under whose wings thou art come to trust. So he blesses her, tells her, I have heard, it has been revealed to me the type of person you are how you've taken care of your mother-in-law, how you've stayed with her. And so he is determined at this point to see that she's cared for. 
She says, Let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for that thou hast comforted me, and for that thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid, though I be not like unto one of thine handmaids. And Boaz said unto her, At meal time come thou hither, and eat of the bread, and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers, and he reached her parched corn, and she did eat, and was sufficed, and then she left. And when she had risen up to glean, went back out to work after eating lunch, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and reproach her not. And let, some, and let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her, and lead them, that she may glean them, and rebuke her not. So she continued to pick up barley until the evening. She beat out that which she had gleaned, and she had about an ephah of barley. And she took it up and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw that she had gleaned, and she brought forth and gave to her what she had reserved after she had sufficed. So she took what she had earned that day, which was the barley, and she returned it to her mother-in-law, and she also took her mother-in-law what was left from her lunch. You kind of get a, an idea of how much she thought about her mother-in-law and how much she cared about taking care of her mother-in-law. And her mother-in-law said unto her, Where hast thou gleaned today, and where wrought thou? Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee, and she showed her mother-in-law with whom she had wrought, and said, The man's name with whom I wrought today is Boaz. Now, her mother-in-law recognizes that this is a kinsman and even a cloth kinsman. And she says to her in verse 22, It is good, my daughter, that thou go out with his maidens, that they meet thee not in any other field. So she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of the barley harvest and of the wheat harvest and dwelt with her mother-in-law. She had gone out, worked every day, gleaned the fields, returned it to her mother-in-law, been blessed by Boaz because of her faithfulness to her mother-in-law. She had done what she had to do as a stranger in someone else's land to be accepted. And she had done it with the right heart. And she had found kindness among strangers. She had been blessed because of her devotion to Naomi. In chapter 3, the story goes on that her relationship with Boaz develops more. But according to Jewish law, the land that Naomi possessed and Ruth possessed because of her marriage to Naomi's oldest son could be redeemed by a close kinsman. So they would buy the land. So Boaz knew that he was not the closest kinsman, and he met with the closest kinsman and said, Naomi has returned. You need to redeem her land, and you need to redeem Ruth's portion as well. And his kinsman said, I cannot. I couldn't afford it. I don't know what the situation was where he could not redeem it. But Boaz, in front of witnesses, said, I would do so, and I will also pay the share, and I will marry Ruth. So Ruth and Boaz are married, and Ruth bears a son. Scripture says that the Lord gave her a son. And what we learn in Scripture is that son was the grandfather of King David. Father of Jesse, grandfather of King David. 
So her devotion to God rewarded her with a son that Naomi took a great part in raising, according to Scripture. So Naomi was blessed with a son as well. A grandson, if you will. And I would ask all of you, are you reaping the rewards of your devotion to God? Are you doing the work that you need to be doing to reap the reward that God offers all of us? The peace of mind. The comfort. The being content in any situation. That's what God offers. That's what God offers all of us. Those of us who devote ourselves to His service. And I said earlier, and I really believe this, that that story turned when Ruth rejected the gods of her fathers to follow the God of the Israelites, our God, the one true living God. He made sure she was blessed. He makes sure each of us is blessed. He's going to bless our children. We need to be devoted to our service of God. Mr. Jimmy mentioned something last night about, and it ties back to this story about Sodom and Gomorrah. I hope you remember the, the origin of the Moabites. If you go back and look at the, the story about Sodom and Gomorrah and the story of Lot, then you will realize that uh, Moab and the Moabites were the descendants of Lot. Lot and his daughter. They were a, a terrible people, as you might imagine. And eventually God destroyed them. They were destroyed for their wickedness. And it says a lot about Ruth that she was raised in Moab that there is hope for everybody. There is redemption for everybody. I worry about our young people, and especially in this world, that we can continue to protect them and more than anything, just teach them the truth. Teach them the truth that lies in Scripture and that lies with the Lord. If you haven't committed yourself to be devoted to God's service, then I would invite you tonight to do so. That baptistry and that baptism that can take place in that baptistry will anchor you for the rest of your life. When life storms blow, and they threaten to blow you away, you'll always be anchored back to that baptistry. You'll always be anchored to God. You'll always be anchored to Jesus. And you will have hope. Outside of that, there is no hope. No hope of eternal life. If you haven't been baptized, if you have been baptized and you need to repent of something, if you need the prayers of this congregation, then I would invite you at this time to come forward as we stand and as we sing. Enter Jesus for the cleansing power. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed? 
blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are you garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood? In the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb, are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Eight hundred fifty-three before our closing prayer. God is so good. God is so good, God is so good, God is so good, he's so good to me. He answers prayer, he answers prayer, he answers prayer, he's so good to me, he cares for me, he cares for me, he cares for me, He's so good to me. I love him so. I love him so. I love him so. He's so good to me. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this day, for our many blessings. Thank Thee for the opportunity we've had to gather here to study a portion of Thy Word. Pray that we take the things that we've learned tonight and apply them to our lives, that we might become better Christians. We thank Thee for the efforts put forth for preparing the meals and also for the Bible school that's been put on this week. Pray your blessings on Mike and all the teachers. We want to thank him for a great lesson tonight. We thank thee for thy son, Jesus Christ, for the many things that he has done for us, for the pattern he set for us to follow. And we pray that you would be with, with us, set, forgive us of our sins, and continue to bless us. In Christ's name we pray.